is everyone today doing? Fine. I can't hear you. Fine. Fine. Had breakfast in the morning? Yes. Full? Yes. So you need to be louder. Right. Um, at first, before that, starting actually, um, I would really like to thank uh, a number of people in this room. But uh, the first, of course, goes, uh, goes to Professor Peswadit Roy Chaudhary, and who's popularly known as brand name BRC. Um, and I extremely thank uh, to him for inviting me here. Um, my This purpose of visit was actually not really uh, any official. I just wanted to visit Kolkata and uh, but of course yes, made out of time of this to just to visit uh, here and give a lecture. And then of course I would also like to thank um, Nat Moore for giving me this great opportunity to be here today. Um, before going, um, I just would like to know the audience in this room, um, what, what are your backgrounds and um, what do you do, if you can randomly speak someone. My name is Ritika Pamuk, I just want to do geography honors. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. from, from which you? Vidyasagar College. Vidyasagar College, okay. And, and some from the back. My name is Karthik Chandalisi, this is Kolar, from Uttar uh, University. And someone from the left? Uh, myself, Sanat Dabush. I'm currently working at PSC from Calcutta University. Great. Okay, so most of them are like in geography itself, right? Right, great. So uh, let me just talk about a bit of myself. Um, you know, Dr. Kumil, you have seen my name. Uh, then I have a bachelor's in undergrads in architecture, so that is one of my passion for architecture. And of course, no city in this India is better than you know, Kolkata because of its great historical colonial architecture and um, other thing and of course I have a planning background as well, urban planning. So architecture and planning are some things which are very extremely close to my heart and I had a, a visit, this is my third visit to Kolkata, it was, I've been a couple of times before but of course seeing it has always been like, um, you know, as a tourist rather than being a localist. So yesterday, now this is the first time maybe I'm seeing from the eyes of a local life. Uh, uh, so uh, BRC has been kind enough to drive me around, to show me around Kolkata, and it has a great architecture. And I would say for sure, and I have a PhD in uh, geography, so that's where I am largely my work. So it's big. the reason I'm talking about a bit of my background is that I have a work, my work is largely based in the nexus of planning and geography. So that's where I bring different lens. So urban environment and geography uh, and social inequalities. But my work is largely based on evidence-based work because it's just not purely uh, conceptual or theoretical. I draw on different theories, but it's largely based on evidence-based Depend, uh, drawing real scientific experiments and uh, um, in real world problems and solutions. That's what I do. Um, so today's topic, uh, it, it's a lot of work that I've been doing in the last uh, few years. But today what I'll do is talk like a couple of years project, few projects that I have been working on in the last couple of years, largely on um, cooling cities, looking at um, urban heat, because we know urban heat is a major issue in India um, and risk and resilience, how building resilience is extremely important to for cities, uh, making better cities and livable cities. Um, you all know about smart cities, right? Smart cities mission, government mission uh, of India, which is 100 smart cities. Uh, the, one of the major mission is actually to objective or aim of the mission is actually to make livable, healthy, sustainable and resilient cities. I don't know how many of you have actually seen the Smart Cities Mission Objective. It clearly says to build India cities into smart, livable, healthy, sustainable and resilient cities. So um, that's where this whole concept comes and uh, so in the last, like we, we, we don't need to really introduce I guess uh, about heat issue in, in India in the last couple of years. You, have, you might have actually seen that uh, increasingly temperatures are increasing in India, uh, in, in, especially in the last <coughs> decade or so. Uh, and last year, how, you, how many of you know about what happened last year, you know, um, in different parts of the country? Uh, in Bihar, people like government has issued warning 
that um, issued holidays, extended period of heat waves. It ran all the way up to October. Um, and also temperatures have significantly increased. And not just that, the, apart from the ambient temperatures, the frequency of heat waves itself has increased. And also um, duration of hot spells. And this is this, I really like, um, I, I've, I've made this, I always call this quote, this February, less February, meaning usually, what is February month? It's always nice, cooler, chill, and it's extremely livable month. But in last some time, um, the less fab sort of month, fab of February has become less. So it's become more and more extreme hotter, hot, hot waves, I mean heat waves and hotter periods have become longer and more often. Um, and this is some of, uh, one of my recently uh, published paper which we worked on looking at different temperatures of mean maximum and minimum temperatures and we found out that in the last hundred years if you see so this is for the last hundred years or so uh, analysis and we found out that the annual maximum temperatures have the linear trends have increased at least by about 0 0.2 degrees per 10 years in the last 10 years especially whereas before that uh, for the next 90, 90 years, it was only like 0.07 or 0.1. So it shows that about 10 uh, 0.1 has been just in the last 10 years. So if we see such kind of patterns increase in the future, it would be more more shorter spans uh, would be increasing. And not only that, if we see apart from the daytime temperatures, the nighttime temperatures have actually significantly increased. Can anyone tell what, why is this happening? Daytime temperatures have only increased like 0.4 to 0.5 or so. But in the nighttime temperatures have increased about 1.2 to 1.3 around that. Why is that reason? What's the reason to nighttime temperatures are actually increasing in during summers? Um, mostly, uh, the the and yes. Yes, that's the reason, right? So whole day the, the heat that, that's absorbed by the materials, <coughs> building materials. And increasingly, in, in I was seeing this historical architecture of uh, um, Kolkata. It was traditionally more materials were used, more bricks, mud, uh, you know, those kind of materials which was less absorbing heat were traditionally used. But whereas now we are increasingly using glass, cement, concrete, and all these buildings absorb quickly heat. But they retain also heat. They don't the like mud bricks and all. What do they use? They absorb heat, but they quickly spill out, right? But these sort of new materials, they absorb heat, but they keep it for a longer time. So all the day, like once we finish, like the day is finished at five o'clock or six o'clock, right? And but they retain it for a longer period. So the heat is released in the night, three or four hours later, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock. That's when the heat is released. And that's the reason is actually it's the nighttime temperatures are more increasing. Uh, and the projections, our projections shows that in the next 2030 or 2050, they would be uh, in a normal scenarios, business as usual scenarios, it would be about 2.0 or 2. Point, around 2.0 to 2.9 or 3 degrees centigrade. And by the end of this century, it is expected that 2100, if we are all alive by then, um, it would be about 4 to 5 degrees centigrade. The atmosphere is composed of various natural gases, of which nitrogen, oxygen and argon constitute 99.93%. .9 However, there are other gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and ozone which have a greater impact on the greenhouse effect. Moreover, artificial gases called chlorofluorocarbons are also present in the atmosphere. In the right proportion, these gases perform their duty. But when its concentration increases by the action of man, the atmosphere retains more heat than necessary, causing rising temperatures, melting ice caps, desertification, fires, storms and floods. Why do greenhouse gases increase? There are three main reasons. The burning of fossil fuels like oil, coal and natural gas. Forest deforestation and destruction of marine ecosystems that absorb carbon dioxide and the increase of a population that increasingly consumes natural resources.
now that you know what causes the problem, you can help reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. So, I don't need to tell you this. The reason is that you all must be knowing about the, reason, this, the major cause for this increasing heating patterns or increasing cooling patterns in some parts of the world. That's climate change. We all know about climate change and what is the underlying condition or, or underlying reasons of this. So, that's greenhouse gas effect. So, I hope you all know about what was shown in that sort of small video. And in generally, uh, so our ecosystems, like we, what we were talking is, in general, our ecosystem is made up of what atmosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, <coughs> nuclear and this is where the built system comes on, built environment, right? So, but on a general condition, our ecosystem should be more sort of these things. But when we're putting up this built environment, this is where we bring, that's what we call urban ecosystems. Because urban ecosystems are usually made up of buildings built on our natural sort of ecosystem. Um, but if we go to the rural side, it is less built environment and we have more natural systems. So in generally, uh, in normal way, this is where the urban heat island comes. So if you go to rural parts of, let's say, the suburban parts of Kolkata, you might have observed it's lesser temperature, it's less hot in some, in, during summers, it's less, less hotter than here. The reason is, what is the reason? The urban heat island effect. And how many of you know what is urban heat island effect? Yeah, the temperature of the particular metropolitan area or city area that is more heated because the uh, carbon dioxide and other natural gas, harmful gases which exist from our um, anthropological effect yeah. and it increases the temperature and heat of our city area. That's why the city area is very heated than some other areas. Yes, yes. That, that's perfectly correct. So that's, that's, that, that is the reason. Uh, and that's why uh, we see higher temperatures, higher <coughs> surface temperatures, both yeah. surface and also ambient temperatures, right? What we see um, in, and also we see warmer airs during summers. We see very extremely hot air that yeah. we feel, right? And whereas in rural areas, so this is a pattern of urban heat island, right? When you see higher temperatures peak re reaching in the central part of the city, and where you go to the suburban areas and then rural areas, the sort of temperatures would reduce. Um, and there are sort of three different patterns of UHI, urban heat island effect, which is what we call planetary boundary layer and surface heat island canopy levels. Um, so what are these, um, again, do you, are you aware of what are these different things? You're aware of all of that, right? Yeah, so it's basically at canopy level, which is basically at the canopy meaning trees, um, three canopy level, that's where the ambient or ambient, temp or ambient urban heat island effect happens and whereas the surface, surface is more on the atmospheric surface level, that's that's the surface urban heat island and planetary boundary is the bigger um, urban heat island I think, that happens in cities and across across regions, not just one city but it happens across bigger regions. Um, and we see what are the impacts of urban heat island effect? Yeah. And then the implications and the impacts of urban heat island effect. The people with uh, very virus disease from their skin yes. their bodies and suffering mm -hmm. from uh, oxygen and that. Yes, and, and especially heat waves, heat waves yes. resulting in deaths, yes. increasing deaths, human deaths. And one of the biggest reasons is also uh, another implication is actually cooling, increasing cooling energy consumption. Yeah. Right? We, we need more air conditioners for room, we need more, and then this is cyclic then. Um, and of course impact on um, uh, air and water quality, and also of course serious threat for human systems. So this is the natural ecosystem that I was talking about before. In a general pattern, this is how our natural ecosystem looks. Whereas we bring all these things, um, the more built environment, the glasses, pollution, and of course, um, air conditioners result in the increase. So this is uh, our research, recent research, which we sort of mapped urban heat island effect for the entire world. And we found out that um, urban heat island effect magnitude in the Asia Pacific 
is extremely higher. Where, where is it higher? Which, which sort of countries or regions? We can see dark red patterns and sort of almost dark and, um, in somewhere in India, right? Um, so that's uh, apart from the sort of coastal part of the US and um, yeah, 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 that's where we see. Um, so this is significantly, but the other reason is also one of the important reasons that we should not forget is, all, is that the coastal cities will face higher UHI than um, the hinterland. And why is that? Why does coastal part, coastal cities, I am from, uh, my native is from Vishakhapatnam, I'm from Vaisak. Uh, so every summer, um, I mean, I've never lived there. I've only lived like my 12th standard. After that, I've never lived there. But still, I know uh, that it is much more hotter when I go there, visit every now and then I visit. It is much more hotter that I feel than if I go to, let's say, some other part of central part of India, like Allahabad or other parts where it is much more lesser. Why does coastal cities, you feel much more warmer and hotter than the than the hinterland cities. Yeah, and oh yes, and also humidity. Land getting heating very fast, but radiating also very fast. Very fast. But ocean, they are opposite from the land surface. Yes. That's why the ocean they are very warmer than the hinterland. Hinterland, right? That's correct. So that's that's exactly correct. That's why coastal cities are much more hotter because some co it's in a way coast benefits from sea breezes because then you have also cold breeze coming in right but also then that air becomes warmer because of the hot hotter part of the land and then it circulates sort of uh, warmer air around the city and then of course it mixes up with humidity right so that makes it warmer because in generally in hinterland what happens is that the UHI can, uh, once in the evening, it can dissipate. Whereas sea breeze will actually stop it to actually being dissipated. So it, it just keeps revolving around the city, even during the night. Uh, this is another, so there are like different types of how UHI can be measured. We know urban heat island effect. Now we need to know how it can be measured. Um, what are the different types? So the first one in terms of measurement is Mobile, uh, urban traverses or which we call mobile traverses. What is mobile traverse and how does mobile traverse measurement can be done is that you have um, a, a small vehicle, a bus or, a, or even a small, just a small vehicle which you can install uh, urban heat and measuring equipment and then you move around the city. We have a big city like Kolkata. Not every part has the same impact like all. Some part, maybe, I, I have no idea much about Kolkata, but maybe some areas can have, can be more hotter than the other, other areas. So we need to first understand at a regional level, at a city level, <laughs> which areas are more, have higher impact or more prone to um, climate change or urban heat higher effect. So that's what we call vulnerability assessment, which is IPCC's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Standard Measuring way which is vulnerability measurement or assessment which we call this is actually from even base action usually what happens in government of india what does it takes action always emergency heat wave emergency so after heat wave comes then the government take action meaning putting more water stations cooling water stations or even putting more maybe uh, higher uh, more number of uh, <laughs> doctors and all that that's what they do emergency action plans that government of india has for every city now um, but how about we instead of doing from an event based action to actually a place based ones what are place based ones to understand which areas are more prone so we can only address those areas we don't need to do for the entire city because if it's not really high impact we don't need to do uh, so this way we can actually reduce government's infrastructure money and a number of things so the first one is to measure this thing so we have done a lot of research on different parts so there's a couple of papers of mine um, in for india uh, we have measured for the entire india 
to see which areas are highly highly impact and this is one of my students project uh, she has done a map for entire Sydney um, so to understand which areas are really highly impact so so the using vulnerability assessment I'll come just in the next slide maybe before uh, explaining what it is so how is vulnerability assessment measured there are, it is a function of exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity and um, anyone knows about this sort of uh, vulnerability assessment method it's globally used by all international organizations or universities to measure vulnerability it's basically exposure sensitive adaptive capacity and what is an exposure exposure is basically uh, the presence of people livelihoods so the higher sort of climate change the more exposed who are the most exposed right people their livelihoods um, and based on infrastructure and other things and sensitivity what is sensitivity is sensitivity is basically a degree to which the system is both adversely or beneficially affected by a hazard when a hazard happens because let's say if, if already some part of people people are usually exposed but what sensitivity makes them more poor poor people if they don't have money less economic poor people or people with ailing conditions health conditions can be more sensitive to more hot heat up uh, thing and adaptive capacity adaptive capacity is so we we people or um, housing conditions if we have better housing conditions if we have better economy we can always buy an air conditioning sit buy a car go so we can avoid so the, the, that is called adaptive capacity so that's the function of so basically uh, vulnerability is a function of these three vulnerability increases if exposure and sensitivity increases but uh, vulnerability decreases if adaptive capacity also decreases but if the same adaptive capacity increases vulnerability can decrease so if we can help governments to help identify increase adaptive capacity of people then automatically vulnerability can um, decrease uh, increase so this was this to my student project she has um, she is a master's student um, who used GIS to map the entire city of Sydney she used data uh, of 2011 and 16 census data of Australian governments and we mapped for this and we found out that the certain po pockets of I'm not sure how much you know about Sydney but uh, certain pockets of Sydney are highly vulnerable especially the western part of Sydney oh is this a touch uh, the western part of Sydney and the coastal part so this is C right um, on the right side and the western part are much more vulnerable the reason is what's the reason so the the right part of this which is near to the coast it's a richer area people rich people live in that area but because of the coast it's more vulnerable and the west part of the Sydney is inside but why it is vulnerable is that that's where poor people live indigenous communities aboriginals uh, local you know indigenous communities and poor poor people um, and native black communities and all those people live on the western part of the Sydney so that's why western part of the Sydney is highly vulnerable so that's so if we identify such kind of areas it's much more easy for governments to only address those areas than actually doing the entire part of the city uh, so the then so that's step one then what's step two step two is mitigation how about we identify those areas and do some kind of projects which can mitigate heat right so in those areas we can identify a number of different technologies that can be soft and hard so let's say so these are few I'm not talking all of the technologies but one is urban water based landscape now we see a number of a number of cities are actually implementing so the old we all know about old water fountains swimming pools the water is of course one of them then that's why actually uh, if you see many cities are located along rivers and um, lakes and things even Kolkata along the dangerous <coughs> river why the reason is that that's where people flourished or communities are, are for, for centuries civilizations flourished 
right? So water can, we found out that water can significantly reduce heat and green infrastructure. Trees, we all know, trees are one simple way to reduce heat, it's simple way. Now there are more news because in cities and homes we don't have spaces for big trees. That's where new technologies like new uh, <coughs> things like green roofs, vertical gardens are used and cool roofs. Um, cool roofs are basically uh, sort of white reflecting roofs, right, which can dark roofs absorb heat because, you know, it can dark materials usually absorb, whereas white, we know it reflects, right? So cool roofs are basically reflective uses. Now, many people are using cool roofs with combination of other roofs like solar and other sort of things. And building shading features, we all know. Uh, I was walking around uh, sort of old part of Kolkata yesterday and I was seeing the f how, you know, the front facades, which we call in architectural land, and facades are, it's not directly exposed to the external part. You always have a small balcony, right? That's because the sun, the sun rays can be blocked and does not allow to enter directly through the windows. That's how traditional architecture was, great architecture was in the past in India. Now we want a great glass facade, so it can come directly. It increases heat, right? So these are new sort of things that are being now increasingly used around the world to reduce this thing, uh, to reduce heat. Um, in India also now, uh, many, many initiatives are being done across different, not just individual houses and individual sort of, uh, initiatives but also big scale uh, many if you go to bangalore bangalore has now many metro metro stations all has these vertical gardens big vertical gardens um, and a number of other stations have come up with uh, green infrastructure like vertical gardens and green roofs um, we found out that urban green infrastructure can reduce in india temperatures anywhere between 2 to 2.5 degrees and that's the best that we can get actually and trees are of course, I mean, it's, it's widely known. We, there's nothing we need to talk about trees. But when there's no space for trees, there's always green roofs and uh, vertical gardens. That's the best way that it can be implemented on any buildings. And we found out that a combination of all of these can be extremely useful. Um, so this is some of the parts in Sydney that we measure thermal imaging, that we call. Um, and you can see the red ones are the exposed roof, right? That's where it is extremely high, anywhere between 40 to 43 degrees centigrade. Whereas the trees where there are trees and green infrastructure, it's in less like 20 degrees centigrade. Um, so increasing, and we found out that in India, if it, can anyone tell what is the average canopy tree coverage in India, overall country? I mean, of course, different cities and different states has different percentages, but in general, the entire country, how much percentage of tree canopy cover? We're sitting in that moment. 23 to 26. 23 to 26? I think so. That's all. Any, any more numbers? Just throw random numbers. It's less than 20. The average is about 15. The average tree canopy cover in India is only 15. Um, some cities have, few cities, the greener cities has about 20 to 25. Highest is 30. Chandigarh is 30. Chandigarh is only city, if you know, it's like Chandigarh, Gandhinagar, yeah, these sort of cities are around those sort of 25 to 30. The rest of all are less than 20. So that's which is like really less. Whereas if you go to many parts like South Africa, some of the parts of South Africa has 50% green cover. So that's where we are sort of, it's even in Sydney, average itself is 40. Average 40% 40 green cover. So we're looking at that kind, if we're looking at that kind of, you know, um, green cover, we need to increase the tree coverage. So we found out that if we increase tree coverage just by 10%, uh, the surface temperature can be reduced around like 1.5 to 2, sorry that's not 50. Um, in general overall 1.5 degrees um, at district level. And then the next one is blue infrastructure. We know um, blue infrastructure we were talking about water. So uh, already 
there are many cities which are using different uh, water in a different ways. I mean, lakes, pools, swimming pools, water fountains are small things. I mean, we all know basic. Now there are more, much more advanced sort of ways that water can ease integrated. <coughs> many cities. So this picture on the left, which you can, I don't know if you can see, uh, it was South Korea uh, in uh, in one of the cities in South Korea, which was before like that from cars and they have knocked down the entire flyover um, and made more better integrated waterways uh, integrated with more green coverage so you can get cars out and bring more people in um, and increase public transport systems and this way we found uh, the research shows that the temperature is reduced by around three degrees even the picture on the right is from Singapore Singapore, I would say for sure, is one of the best countries in the world. I was just 10 days back, I was in Singapore. Um, and I was looking at how best the planning, their planning was. They have, it's a very small city country, right? They have, it's all the way, it takes only like half a day, you can see the entire country. Um, whereas, with that limited space, they have integrated a lot of water and green. So within buildings, different buildings, you have walkways, which is covered with green infrastructure. It's, it's small, I know it's, it's a rich country, but with small things, they can be better initiated. Like just using simple like water and green is not like a lot of money, you don't need even a lot of money. So that's one thing uh, is that can be integrated. And integrating both green and blue, like what we saw in Singapore, can be the best way to reduce uh, uh, urban heat. And uh, in the recent years, especially uh, countries like this, the picture on the left is in Sydney. Sydney becomes extremely hot during summers. Um, well, it's only 32 degrees, but, but that's high for the Western world. Um, and what the governments are doing is actually installing some kind of water fountains and sprinklers and towers, which can help cool people um, in the summers. And we found out that these new sort of uh, initiatives can reduce anywhere between 1 degree to 3.5 degrees and this is something uh, which we prepared recently a, rep a report or a guideline for the government uh, of Australia to help identify which place what sort of green blue infrastructure can be used because not every way you can use the same sort of uh, green blue at street level it can be different at, um, at home level it can be something else, in academic institutions it can be something else. So we have identified for different areas, inner city, suburbs and other suburbs what sort of uh, different initiatives can be used and what is the impact where like say for example here we see green roofs and inner city can be extremely useful, it has high impact, positive impact. Whereas tree and canopy in plaza level can be less because there won't be much space and also it is not really possible because tree only has certain height right so it cannot really help taller buildings because let's say tree has like 10 or uh, 5 meters or 6 meters whereas in inner city bigger cities have like 40 meters of big buildings so then tree is not really useful to cool the building so that's where we found out that green roofs can be extremely useful uh, because green roofs are laid on top of the building so that can be extremely helpful because it can cool just the building. You don't need trees there. So we identify that kind of initiative, different um, uh, infrastructure, how it can impact positively urban heat. And this is another new sort of interconnected green networks, which is now being used by many countries around the world, uh, which are actually interconnected green networks in the sense you can connect um, small parks which is at a small uh, community level to bigger parks to larger hubs of green uh, network like maybe uh, forest or urban urban forest or other things small wetlands you know Kolkata has wetland uh, so that can be connected to small parks and all these infrastructure can help urban green infrastructure can actually help cool cities and many cities around the world are now using this sort of um, interconnected green networks one is of course London is using that green uh, London green grid which is called 
Uh, so basically what it is doing is that connecting all London parks, whatever small, 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 small parks, <coughs> are connected through a, uh, through a way of different pathways. The same way Sydney is coming up with a Sydney Green Grid, which is again the same, all green infrastructure or green uh, is being connected. So there is an app that was created by the Sydney Green Grid, which you can install and once you, if, you, if I want to walk, I don't want to take my vehicle, I want to walk to my office, I will put up, okay, I show me the best way through which I can avoid heat and I can walk under the shades and trees and parks and things like that. It will show the best way where I can walk through parks. Um, so that's one thing um, it is coming up with this. So the such kind of initiatives are being implemented around the world. Um, so this, this is interconnected green networks. So starting from neighborhood level, which is more small community <coughs> level, to big strategic scale. City, not just city, but which is out of city. Now, you know, metropolitan Kolkata region, bigger region. So that kind of regional level, you can connect different sort of um, green infrastructure. I'm not going into all of this because it's a lot of thing and I don't want to talk all of this, but, but it's just how different green infrastructure can be connected starting from one single tree to big strategic corridors, you know, big, big corridors. And finally, this is uh, one cool materials that we are developing at our own laboratory. Cool materials, usually what, uh, cool roofs and cool materials are white. That's what we do. But we don't want white for our nice, beautiful buildings, right? Some, some people might want colors, different colors. Um, so then we came up with different color, color materials, which if you paint during summers, it will, uh, or extreme heat during the day, that color material will transform into white. So the heat can be reflected back. And in the night it, or in the evenings, once there's no sun, it can convert back into um, colored material. So this is highly, we found out that this is highly useful and uh, extremely useful for cities and houses. And also, of course, um, solar pathways and other sort of pathways. Uh, and this is what, one best example, uh, we all know Jaisalmer city is one of the best example for cool roof. Why Jaisalmer had, I mean the entire city, it's not now, it's been there for hundred, hundreds of years. The entire Jaisalmer city is actually white. Uh, the roofs are white. They are, what, what white is that? Even many parts of Gujarat, they use it. Broken mosaic, which we use for homes, mosaic tiles, you know. So those broken mosaic, when you prepare mosaic, small pieces which we are broken. Those broken pieces are used for roof, all the roofs and exposed surfaces in houses because that can reflect. So white pieces, even, even <coughs> in public parks, benches, um, and a number of surfaces are actually used these things. Whereas in Delhi, <coughs> our houses are dark roofs. Um, so cool materials are extremely <coughs> useful where there is less money, uh, budget is budget is less, and no space because trees need more space. Green infrastructure also need more money, but <coughs> broken mosaic is available everywhere, just around the corner. So you can bring those chips and just put it on your house, and that is just that's all. Uh, that's being used now. Many things. So advanced materials in cool materials now. The basic ones is broken mosaic, but now <coughs> they are more. Uh, like paints, which is white paints, which are also very cheap. Um, it comes anywhere between 100, one, one, 100 liters or something, might be around 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees, which can cover an entire huge roof. Um, so this is a project, one of my projects that I have done in one of the slum communities in Hyderabad. Um, so this project, so what we did was to help, because we know slums are where they use asbestos sheets roofs, right? And asbestos sheets roofs is extremely dangerous for, uh, you know, for how people living inside. It, it, it increases heat more, not just uh, ab absorption, but actually it takes in and increases the heat. So we did um, uh, install with, within collaboration, thanks to our partners, all of our partners who have, uh, so we had few industry partners uh, who has helped and provided free materials, these cool roofs, cool, cool roofs, which are basically, because these are asbestos, we cannot use paints, right? So what we did was these are removable sheets, white sheets, which you can install on the house. And during some our winters, 
or during rainy season you can remove or reverse it and use it for rains because you know in most of the slum houses they have these blue turpentine sheets they use for you know water leakage for houses what we did was use these sheets uh, during summer and we measured and we found out so this is the sheet you can see those pictures on the left uh, the white sheets and uh, so the picture on the right is the difference between uh, temperature <coughs> difference between the white sheet and the asbestos sheet so we used this for um, for a longer period for the uh, for the entire summer in 2017 uh, six months and we found out that the average surface temperature reduction can increase anywhere by 10 to 15 degrees centigrade uh, dupont is the chemical company which was our partner for this project and they have so we are planning to do this project in a big scale to uh, do maybe half of delhi or half of Ahmedabad that we are planning next um, and uh, we, yeah we were keen for that and if so this project was highly successful after this project i'm extremely uh, i mean we are extremely happy also to share that uh, after this project we had another project in hyderabad more in slum communities and the hyderabad government or telangana government came up as a result of this project they come up they came up with a policy which is called cool roof policy now all new homes in hyderabad and telangana need to be painted cool roofs so this is a government mandatory policy that all new homes of a specific size need to be painted white. Um, otherwise you will not get a building permission. So that's what uh, is the result of this project. And this is another project that we did. Uh, sorry, this is step three, which is now decision making. Now we have seen how to assess, then identify the different technologies. Now how do we influence government? That's one step I told, what, how this project of Cool Roof help government take decision and come up with a state level policy because at the, at the end whatever we do we want to influence governments and we want governments to come up with policies and to you know bigger scale to be implemented in a larger scale to have bigger impacts um, so this is another uh, project that I will just talk a bit late one one step later about how we have been influencing governments through our projects through my own projects um, I've, I've led like tens of projects in the last couple of years um, working with governments uh, around the world including India, China and Australia. This is where I work largely, my experience in India, China and Australia. Uh, so we've been working, so this project was in Australia. This is uh, the western part of Sydney I was talking about previously where poorer people live um, and has higher um, heating. So. Parmara, that's the western part of the Sydney. We work with the city council. This is the thermal video uh, we recorded. We have a drone at our own uni, and so we used our own drone. Uh, it's one of the big drone, and we used this to map the entire western Sydney to see where exactly is um, the hotter parts of the world and what, where, how do we can help governments to identify what, how government can take this better decision making. So you've just seen, so so that's the entire Sydney, so the, the, those are the bigger shopping malls, so that's the, and this, the blue one which you can see, can you see that, the blue one, what's that, it's a water body, right, water body, so that's the Parramatta River, that's the Parramatta River that's uh, crossing the entire the Parramatta city, so yeah, that's the river, and along the river, you can see it's much more lesser heat than compared to so so this is how we uh, identified a lot go and I think to stop it there um, so we helped uh, government city of Sydney come up with the land use use the land use and identified the future climate the first step is to identify what is the future climate right before actually helping the Bible so we did first what is the future climate and what is the current climate and how does this future climate will will be forecasted in the future and so the future climate scenarios, this is what we came up for different climate scenarios. So this is surface temperature on the left and on the right is the air temperature. Um, on different days, so these are different days and we can see that in certain points of the day, it is extremely hot, right? What, what time is it? It's afternoon, two o'clock, um, that's when the hotter 
things settle down. So this, this, the, the scale of this is 500 by 500, the, the grid. Okay, so that 500 meters by 500 meters. So we have gone really into micro scale measurement of Sydney to identify, better identify the impact. So 500 meters means 500 meters. You can imagine the kind of scale that we really went deeply to understand. And we identified this and then we identified, you know, remember the step two, the heat mitigation, right? The heat mitigation is, now the step two, we have adopted this to identify what is, if we use different kind of technologies, mitigation technologies, how that can be actually uh, address in how that can have impact on heat mitigation which is which is the best scenario do you think of all the six so this is basically green infrastructure only green I mean, but yeah which is the best scenario these are six scenarios but one of them is like the best one fifth why is that why is the fifth the best scenario I think fifth one yeah why is that I think the greenery cover is much more in the fifth. Um, yeah. Compared yeah. to the other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. So the greenery cover is higher, but at the same time, the impact of the green is high. Meaning, so the green cover in the fifth one is about 44%. Right? So 44, when you use 44% on a certain area, you can see the red is really like almost negligible, very negligible, right? So this is the best scenario. So this is what the governments want, or in general, even we want to do our own projects or anything. This is extremely important to identify what are the best scenarios. So we used uh, different scenarios. So starting from 10, 20, 30, 40, 44, <coughs> mixing those sort of different scenarios. And we came up with this best scenario. Um, and the same thing which we did for the urban heat island decision-making tool project, this is for, um, for a number of governments in Sydney. Um, Sydney is a big metropolitan, like let's say in, in Kolkata, and within Kolkata you have smaller regions, but in Sydney we have, in there are different councils, different local governments. Um, so that's how you measure mobile traverses, and we sort of measured uh, by using mobile traverses or mobile traverses data for different parts of the world in, in, in different parts, and we found out that you can see, like. Some of Indian cities are extremely high, uh, and or, or in general, Asia Pacific countries are have high UHI in mobile traverses. And specifically, looking at magnitude of UHI in India, there are two measurements. Uh, like we already seen, atmospheric and surface UHI. Right? In two things, we have measured for different cities or not all of the cities of course because it's huge india is huge we can't measure for all cities uh, we just measured for a few cities and both in both ways and we found out that uh, some of it so you can see here um, in atmospheric chennai for example because it's like an extremely big coastal city uh, has high and also the surface <coughs> in chennai is high because of um, coastal part and what we found out by using this measurement measuring equipment is that there is a difference between 2.0 to 10.4 um, in by different equipment. So by using mobile traverses, there's anywhere between 2.12 um, degrees to 2.9. Whereas by using standard measuring equipment, what are standard measuring equipment? Usually, how uh, weather is monitored is we all know weather monitoring stations, right? <coughs> so most usually, uh, the large in terms of like general patterns of measuring UHI is through weather stations, weather monitoring stations. Um, but whereas there's a big problem in using weather monitoring stations um, for, um, for UHI. What's the reason? Can anyone tell? Why is the difference in using weather monitoring stations for UHI is extremely high compared to mobile traverses? Where are weather monitoring stations usually located? Main portion of the city and how many like, it, it's not even main portion of the city, it's maybe located no, outskirts, outskirts, outskirts of the city, right? Outskirts of the city. So you cannot get the exact sort of patterns of the city because they're outside of the city. Whereas mobile traverses is less difference because you move around the city to measure. So you get a better, higher sort of uh, relate relativity measurements. 
and non-standard other non-standard measuring equipments are like there are in the recent years there's extremely advanced scientific equipment that are being used around the world uh, about measuring I'll come a bit later about how we measure in Australia we have our own weather monitoring station for our university it is not a fixed weather monitoring station but it is a mobile it's a it's called as an energy bus which we take around to measure our own wherever we go we just measure our um, uh, weather so that's uh, a new sort of they are called micro meteorological stations and also satellite thermal imagery so of course this is one common uh, way how uh, where this is measured and so what we found out is that by using non-standard measuring equipment there is higher uh, intensity values so we by using our like micro meteorological station that's called our energy bus which we which ha which can go which has a mast up to 20 meters so that's like going how many floors three meters is one one floor level so 20 meters almost like six seven, six, seven floor levels so that's what we have uh, so we get better sort of data so we we found out that it's higher intensity um, and of course uh, the surface UHI is so they therefore is higher than the atmospheric UHI uh, we have seen of course the impact of uh, urban heat on human life and what we found out is that extreme cities especially in cities where there's high humidity can affect human body and why is that and why does because high humidity impacts heat and humidity is extremely bad for human health we lose sweat, sweat yeah. our liquids in the form of sweat so that results in serious dehydration and also heat strokes and heat stress um, old people especially old people children pregnant ladies they can face all these problems in summer and that's the reason people say that you know these sort of age groups high, higher age groups or children especially young children need to have more better uh, uh, taking liquids and other things so this is uh, what we also sort of mapped in the last 50 years or so data in terms of urban heat and impacts on human life uh, we found out you can see um, where's the high amount of deaths in the last 10 years or so right um, so that's heat mortality and also interesting thing that we observe is that once a temperature goes above 40 degrees there is at least heat mortality uh, increases by at least 10 percent so and last year we saw the new newspapers in many cities when 40 degrees cross there were school holidays the government shut down many uh, uh, for many days schools and offices and other things so that's an extreme um, heat thing so we that's important point Another impact is on energy. That's we don't need to tell, of course. But our research shows that energy consumption in cities with more than one lakh, pop, the cities with increases about three to eight degrees when per degree rise of temperature. So that's let's say 40 degrees. So then there's 41 degrees. Just for two or three days, we can see um, energy consumption increases by about three to eight percent. And uh, uh, have we, how many of you also have seen newspapers that air conditioning sales have increased in the last few years? 20% of air conditioning sales increase. Uh, every home previously used to have one air conditioning for the entire home. People used to sleep in one house. Now each house has, sorry, each room has one. So two bedrooms to how many we have in this room? Three. Three. So, so, so that's, that's a kind of scale that we are looking at. And our research shows that in the next um, 10 years or a decade or so, they, this sort of air conditioning sales will increase at least by 20 to 30 percent more. So that becomes India and China, at the moment China is the highest um, in terms of air conditioners use, uh, India will become soon. It's, it's still low yet right now compared to United States and other parts of the world, but it will increase significantly in compared to the heating patterns and this will of course have result again back on UHI what's the reason can anyone tell the UHI will increase if the air conditioning is in increase yes but there's also another thing to the air conditioners what is outside the air conditioning 
So usually the hot air comes out from the external part of the air conditioning, right? So that will increase hot air in the atmosphere. Um, so the more number of air conditioners, the more you have external units. So those external units will increase more hot air. So that will automatically increase uh, your height. So this is what uh, our research, this is according to the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. According to that, so these are the scenarios of the impact on energy. In the next uh, 20 or 30 or 50 years, we found out different patterns. So at the current business as usual scenario, which is without any energy efficiency programs, uh, I don't know how, how many, uh, so this is like I can see uh, without much uh, energy efficient. Daikin is a good one, it's a good air conditioner, usually Daikin is a good company. Uh, they come with high energy efficiency, but, but many, many other home-based sort of air conditioners don't have energy efficient star rating systems. So such kind of scenario will increase energy consumption at least by 200 terawatt hours by 2020 and 1350 <coughs> terawatt hours in 2100. So this will have serious implications on peak demand, which will result in more blackouts, brownouts um, in the cities. We see in summers we have in big cities also Delhi and all often face blackouts and brownouts. Uh, so so that sort of a, gave a broad scenario of what's urban heat island effect and what is the background of it and what is the context of it and what are the impacts of it. Does anyone have any questions before we... Now what we look at the next part is that what are the how we can actually mitigate this and what are the technologies in the sense technologies are not just real hardcore technologies but also soft technologies and how we actually can um, mitigate adapt and also how governments like NATMO decision making organizations can help mitigate these sort of initiatives um, so before that have any really like big questions big burning questions that you can't really keep till the end of the day, I mean, end of the presentation. I mean, we can't, we, we will have a Q&A after the presentation, but if you have a big burning questions that you cannot really hold until the presentation, yes, feel free. Otherwise, can we move? So, what we'll talk for the rest of the presentation is about developing resilience to climate change. And these are sort of all, all which you can also do at your own homes or even um, in your own backyards. Um, and your small homes. I know in cities people mainly live in apartments as well, so smaller spaces. But of course some of these can be implemented. So the first thing, step one, there are three steps to doing this. The first step one is we need to first measure the map. This is a 3D assessment tool. Um, this project was finished last year and what we did was in within those areas we mapped 3D and identified, mapped into a sort of a big scale and we identified what is the impact on the stream so you can see that the same thing and then came up with uh, a tool which can help government so let's say when the government is giving a development approval building approval right or or a big uh, development approval da which is called development approval so then government can when it's approving so this is for the government they can use for the tool and so let's say on the right side planning alternatives they can click let's say if I'm using three four buildings three floor buildings uh, floors and then vegetation let's say 20% of vegetation if the builder because you know how the DA, DA works the builders submit a plan right for the approval then they need to the government need to approve the plan so in planning itself the government say okay you are submitting 10% this is having impact on the region this much heat so increase it to 20 percent they can say that so this is how we did that in 3d and uh, um, we also developed a heat performance index which is actually so this is the heat performance index for different climatic regions where it can help um, you know you can see all those uhi mitigation strategies water evaporative public good all those different things and its effectiveness the uh, people can, I mean the uh, governments and also the institutions can actually see what is the impact and on different, and impact on what? Impact on health, impact on comfort, impact on energy and impact on water. 
Uh, so that's how it is. And so in, in generally, if we see all these things bring into in one sort of slide, whatever I've spoken so far, all those 40 slides or 30 slides, this is one slide I want to talk, is that we need to first identify evidence. And all of my work is evidence-based research. I don't want to talk in generally, you know, without anything. So my work is largely based on evidence-based research, meaning experimenting and finding evidence on everything we do. So we first identify, assess computational, doing different computational assessment, and then see what are the different technologies, and then see the real scale applications. All of my work that I do is real world um, work, which is helpful either for people, or governments, or industry, or for all. So that we do, and all of these technolo technologies can be on the outer ring, if you can see, you know, the darker green ring are the mitigation technologies, and the white is how we do experiments and assessment and techniques. And, and the, the next white, uh, the lower level, is actually what are the real scale applications and how these can impact different sort of things. So that's what I want to talk. And so I've, at the start, if you remember, when I started my presentation, I was talking about why we need to talk about today about heat and healthy and resilient cities is because this is the government of India's mission because I want to connect it, my presentation to bringing it to this, how the government of India has started a bigger mission and how these sort of different technologies or initiatives or strategies can bring or stitch together or into a narrative, the grand narrative. What is a grand narrative? Is we want to build smart, healthy, resilient, livable cities, right? And because at the end, we all want to live in cities. We don't want to live in rural areas. And we need to make our cities more um, livable for all. And of course, the government of India has invested huge amount of money into this. Um, because I have been organizing a number of events uh, on smart cities, Australia, India, knowledge exchange events, Australia, India, smart city, knowledge exchange events on smart cities, and also smart energy management. And what we found out at every step is that government, and I want especially for students, is that government has initiated this, um, or initiated, or is a larger mission, which we call, but they are finding problem in terms of knowledge capital and technology cap. They, are, they have technology, but they don't have knowledge and expertise. Uh, so they are keenly looking for students or experts with expertise in these sort of domains. If you see now what are the domains that are important is no more those old geography measurement um, equipment. We need to upgrade ourselves with the advanced technologies, new technologies that's happening around the world. And we need, or out of that, some of these are now artificial intelligence. Some of the technologies that we used is our own computer smart computing um, technologies and which are all of these are geographical projects but we have been integrating those advanced or, or liaising with technologies so taking benefit out of the technologies to support governments and uh, or even our own geographical studies uh, a lot of work has been published out of these um, and also we are coming there's a couple of new papers coming out of these work so I'm happy if you have any more questions uh, for an interactive session um, it just I just wanted to give a broad overview I don't know if I just went out of your block of mind just dispose it listen from one ear and just dispose it to another but if you have if you're interested I'm happy to talk further thank you